on that in our Treasures from God's Word, and um, we'll be concentrating on the uh, making appointments of elders and, and how that process uh, happens. And then in our Digging for Spiritual Gems, that question, why did Paul not ask Philemon to grant freedom to Onesimus? We'll get that answer. Our Bible reading will be uh, Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. And then we have um, our initial call video, so we'll see that video. That's the third one of the night, by the way. And then we'll have the initial call, and we'll see a couple of examples of that. Um, three examples of that, actually. Uh, and then in our living as Christians, young ones. Be zealous for fine works. Uh, another nice video where we're going to get a chance to hear from several young ones and what they have done to, to make way for pioneering. Really nice. And then in our uh, congregation Bible study, um, why destruction is ahead, Jesus gives a couple of um, uh, illustrations to help people recognize that uh, their viewpoint may not necessarily be right, and we'll learn from that, and we can use that. So to start off, let's have uh, Brother Dare uh, start with our treasures from uh, God's Word, make appointments of elders. Before we get into that part about the elders, we're going to watch our videos of two books that we considered this week in our Bible reading. So let's play first our introduction to Titus, and then right after that we'll go into the introduction to Philemon. An introduction to the book of Titus. The Apostle Paul's inspired letter to Titus was written about 61 to 64 CE. Paul may have written it in Macedonia sometime after his first imprisonment in Rome. Evidently, after his release, Paul served with Titus in Crete. After the apostle left, Titus remained. Titus had a difficult assignment in Crete. As a whole, the people there had a reputation for dishonesty, laziness, and gluttony. Those bad traits had influenced some in the congregation. So in his letter, Paul asked Titus to correct problems in the congregations in Crete and to appoint qualified men to serve as elders. The letter to Titus has three chapters. Chapter 1 sets out the spiritual qualifications for congregation elders. Paul then tells Titus to reprove with severity those who try to mislead their brothers. The deceivers include rebellious men, profitless talkers, and those who insist on adherence to circumcision. In chapter 2, Paul sets out many of the fine qualities that should be displayed by Christian men and women, including slaves. Paul encourages Titus by telling him to speak and act with full authority, adding, Do not let anyone look down on you. Did you know? As shown by Titus' record as a Christian overseer, he could be entrusted with delicate and difficult assignments. He was courageous, firm, loving, and evidently a good organizer. Paul was confident that Titus would do a fine job in Crete. In chapter 3, Paul tells Titus to remind the Christians in Crete to obey the secular authorities to be reasonable, not quarrelsome, and to display mildness toward all. 
Finally, Paul instructs Titus to avoid foolish arguments and fights over the law of Moses and to reject anyone who persists in promoting a sect. As you read the letter to Titus, note how Christian overseers should courageously address problems in the congregation. How God's Spirit can draw people from all backgrounds and help them to develop a Christ-like personality. And how the bad traits that characterize Satan's world should be rejected by all subjects of God's kingdom. In our second video. An introduction to the book of Philemon. Paul wrote this letter primarily to his friend and spiritual brother Philemon who lived in the city of Colossae in Asia Minor. Written in Rome about 60 or 61 CE, the letter concerns Philemon's runaway slave Onesimus. Onesimus somehow became associated with Paul in Rome and soon became a Christian. The letter to Philemon has just 25 verses. Paul opens with greetings to Philemon and to the congregation that meets in his house, including Appia and Archippus. Paul tells Philemon that Onesimus, once considered a useless slave, is now a valuable spiritual brother, so much so that Paul would like Onesimus to stay for some time in Rome. But Paul does not overstep his authority by insisting that Onesimus stay without his master's permission. So Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon, who lives more than 1,400 kilometers away. On the basis of Christian love and personal friendship, Paul appeals to Philemon to receive Onesimus not as a runaway slave, but as a beloved brother. Paul even writes the entire letter in his own hand, which is unusual for him. Did you know? The letter to Philemon was Paul's only inspired letter addressed primarily to a private person about a private matter. The letter could be considered a reintroduction for Onesimus, a slave who is now also a brother. Paul expresses confidence that Philemon will do even more than what is asked. As you read the letter to Philemon, Note how we can express confidence in our brothers. How Paul showed genuine humility by not overstepping his authority. And how he highlighted kindness and forgiveness, qualities that must be displayed by all who want to inherit God's kingdom. Okay. So now let's change the subject a bit here. We're going to talk about making appointments of elders or even ministerial servants. It wasn't that many years ago that when the circuit overseer came to the congregation, the circuit overseer and the elder body would get together and discuss those who would be recommended as a ministerial servant or an elder. If they all agreed on it, brother, basically paperwork would go back to the governing body they get a stamp of approval if they agreed on it. They'd come back here, and then the announcement would be made. Things have changed. The reason is because the governing body has looked at the scriptures. For example, Paul and Barnabas in Acts the 14th chapter, when they, they were on their way back from their first missionary tour, the scripture says that they appointed elders for them in each congregation, offering prayer with fasting, and they entrusted them to Jehovah in whom they had become believers. So you see, they appointed. They didn't go back to Jerusalem, the governing body, but they did it. Years later, with Paul and Titus, it says, I left you, speaking to Titus, he says, and we read that in our reading this week, I left you in Crete so that you would correct the things that were defective and make appointments of elders in city after city, as I instructed you again. He would make the appointments. 
it would not go back to the governing body. So Timothy did the same thing. He was instructed to do the same thing. So with this biblical precedent in mind, the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses has adjusted the appointments the way it's done. And as of September 1st, 2014, appointments appointment which were made differently. During the visit of the circuit overseer, again, the circuit overseer and the brothers, the elders in that congregation would sit down and discuss any who would uh, be candidates to be uh, uh, an elder or a ministerial servant. They would discuss this. And if the circuit overseer and the elder body came to an agreement that this brother met the qualifications to a reasonable degree, then he the circuit overseer would appoint that brother as an elder or a ministerial servant. This arrangement is closer to the first century pattern as we discussed here. So what's this mean? Well, it means that the governing body still is over all of this because they're the ones that have set up this, this system of doing it now, this way of doing it. It's very close to the first century uh, arrangement. But it also means that each body of elders in the congregation has the solemn duty to review thoroughly the scriptural qualifications of the brothers they recommend for appointment in the congregation. It's not just a, I, I like this guy, he's doing a good job. No, you have to go over very seriously the spiritual qualifications that are brought out in the, in the scriptures. Then, each circuit overseer has the serious responsibility to consider carefully and prayerfully the recommendations made by the elders and then to appoint the men who qualify. We can see that Jehovah continues to refine his organization today. It's on the move. Bible-based, right? Exactly the way the process goes. Um, next, let's um, give our attention to Brother San Luis as he takes us through our Digging for Spiritual Gems. Uh, remember that question, why did Paul not ask Philemon to grant freedom to Onesimus? And uh, nice, short, 30-second comments so that uh, uh, Brother uh, San Luis can stay on time. Brother San Luis. So we considered information. Can we have someone read for us Titus chapter 1, verse 2, please? Sister Ruiz? Or is it Sister Goodness? A certain one of them, their own prophet, said, Cretans are always liars, injurious wild beasts, idle gluttons. Thank you for reading that. So then our question here is why does this text not justify? Showing ethnic prejudice. Ethnic prejudice. Sister Handy. Thank you. Well, we can be sure, <coughs> excuse me, of that. Paul knew that on um, Christians, there were fine Christians whom God had approved and anointed with his Holy Spirit. Okay, very true. Sister uh, Cox and then Sister Rogers. So just because there were some that um, had um, these negative traits didn't mean that um, the Cretans on a horse, Sister Annie brought out for the ones who were doing good and doing more spiritually that they were, um, that this was to, to call to, um, to show prejudice to the whole uh, race or the whole um, group. Sister Rogers. And like it brings out, there, there were enough devoted Christians on, in Crete to make up uh, congregate, many congregations in that city, and they had Jehovah's approval. And also, if we look at this text, looking at the context, remember, we're trying to understand the scriptures like the Bereans. If we were just to take this as it is, then Paul is saying this. But if we look at the context, who is saying Brother Alba. So Paul is making a quotation from a Cretan uh, poet uh, drawing as 
just mentioning that because it's not unheard of for people credence to have be of a bad re reputation. That's why you brought that up. Okay, very good. Thank you. Covers those <laughs> thoughts. Let's go to Philemon 15 and 16. Sister uh, Smothers. Perhaps this is really why he broke away for a short while, so that you may have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but, mo but as more than a slave, as a brother who is beloved, especially so to me, but how much more so to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So then our question is, why did Paul not ask Philemon to grant freedom to Onesimus? <laughs> Sister Marin? Because he did not want to get involved in uh, social issues, and that was a social or a law issue for the country there. It didn't have anything to do with doing Jehovah's work, Jehovah's kingdom, announcing Jehovah's kingdom. Okay. Sister Cunningham. So along with that thought, we could see that Paul strictly asked them to um, stick with their commission to preach the kingdom of God and to teach concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we could see that was in total opposition of the slavery issue. To stir Roque. And for to stay stay away from involvement in social issues such as those concerning slavery. You know, nowadays there's just so many things that we need to concern ourselves with. Immigration, the economy. What's the example that we can apply here? Brother Odoi. So without those social issues, we follow the example of Jesus Christ when he was asked to, to mediate between a, a man and his brother over the uh, uh, family inheritance, he refused. He wasn't going to get involved with those social things, and neither would the Apostle Paul. So we also do not get involved. We're not there to preach social justice. We're there to preach the good news of God's kingdom. So we're not getting involved, but you know that question about prejudice earlier? You know, I think they're right, what they say about those people. What can we learn from the first portion about prejudice? Sister Huey. We just don't get involved in social issues. They may be right, they may be wrong, and we just will not uh, address it. Okay. Sister Autier. And Jehovah's looking for right-hearted ones from all the sorts of people in all the nations, so we should have the same view of people. We should be looking for their um, willingness and joy in learning about Jehovah. Very good. Thank you. So what uh, has this week's Bible reading taught us about Jehovah? Or some points. Uh, Brother Harris, and then let's get Brother Thompson in the back, please. I really love um, the first chapter of Titus, um, where and in verses 1 and 2, where... Uh, Paul highlights that uh, to have accurate knowledge of God would automatically lead to godly devotion, that we would want to do it if we actually really knew him, and um, how he continued the thought process that uh, our hope is based on uh, being able to live forever it's what jehovah promised initially he's never changed that we get to the back of the bible and it's talking about the same thing okay good thank you brother thompson and here at uh Philemon, uh verse 23 where the greetings are being sent out and it talks about how um, they're identified by name and where it talks about in 24 uh, mark <laughs> aristarchus demas and luke these are things that we can continue to do to keep our fellow believers in our prayers. Okay, good, thank you. We definitely need that nowadays. What other spiritual gems have you discovered in this week's Bible reading? Sister uh, Cunningham, uh, Sister Chamberlain, sorry. I enjoyed Titus 2-3, uh, where Paul turned his attention here to the older women in the congregation, and he put here, likewise, 
So these women can have uh, considerable influence for the good or for the bad. So the word likewise of the age women, that would mean that they also would have certain responsibilities. And if you go down further, it would be almost, well, not equal to the brother, but showing yourself to be an example of fine words, using wholesome speech that cannot be criticized. So that applies to the older women as well. Uh, so they could be good examples to the younger women in the congregation. Sure. One more comment. What other spiritual gems did we find? Let's get Sister Lynn. Uh, first of Titus 3, verse 8, Paul encouraged the people to keep focus on maintaining a fine work so that we would be healthful in our faith and be no part of the world and have the fruitful work for God assigned us to do. Okay. Thank you, friends, for all your wonderful thoughts. <coughs> Nice comments. Um, I count 15. So that's really, really good. Shows uh, advanced preparation by everyone. Very nice. These are two great books. Now, uh, let's give our attention to our Bible reading. We'll invite uh, Brother uh, Andrew Marin up. Um, Titus 3, 1 through 15. If you can turn there, great. <coughs> Continue reminding them to be in subjection and to be obedient to governments and authorities, to be ready for every good work, to speak injuriously of no one, not to be quarrelsome, but to be reasonable, displaying all mildness toward all men. For we too were once senseless, disobedient, led astray, being slaves to various desires and pleasures, carrying on in badness and envy, detestable, hating one another. However, when the kindness of our Savior God and his love for mankind were manifested, not because of any righteous works we had done, but because of his own mercy, he saved us by means of the bath that brought us to life and by making us new by Holy Spirit. He poured this Spirit out richly on us through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that after being declared righteous through the undeserved kindness of that one, we might become heirs according to a hope of everlasting life. These words are trustworthy, and I want you to keep stressing these matters so that those who believe God may keep their minds focused on maintaining fine works. These things are fine and beneficial to men, but have nothing to do with foolish arguments and genealogies and disputes and fights over the law, for they are unprofitable and futile. As for a man who promotes a sect, reject him after a first and a second admonition knowing that such a man has deviated from the way and is sinning and is self-condemned. When I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, do your utmost to come to me in Nicopolis, for that is where I have decided to spend the winter. Carefully supply Zanus, who, has, who is versed in the law, and Apollos, so that they may lack nothing for their trip. But let our people also learn to maintain fine works so as to help in case of urgent need, so that they may not be unproductive. All those with me send their greetings. Give my greetings to those who have affection for us in the faith. May the undeserved kindness be with you, all of you. Very nicely done, Brother Marin. Thank you so much. Um, you were working on study number five, which is uh, accurate reading. And, well, the, the, the summary says read, exa uh, read aloud exactly what is on the page, and that's exactly what you did. Uh, very nice. You have a very nice reading voice. And uh, you obviously prepared. Uh, you adhere to all the punctuation. That's, that's important. When we're reading, commas, pause, periods, pause longer, right? Very nicely done, and, and you did read in groups of words, which is important. Um, we don't just want to read word after word after word after word, because that doesn't give the sense of what is actually being said. So we want to read kind of in thoughts, and uh, you, you did a, just a really, really nice job on that. 
Um, you enunciated clearly. That was good. You had some uh, tricky names in there, so that means uh, when we're when we're reading the Bible, uh, we can always hit play, right? Hit play, and, and we can get the exact uh, pronunciation of any of the uh, words specifically. You know, names they can be hard. Uh, really enjoyed it. Nice job. Thank you so much. Now. As we go into our apply ourselves to the field ministry, first we'll have um, the the uh, video. So let's watch the video and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Hi, my name is Isabella and this is my mom. A lot of people are concerned about all the sickness that's been going around lately. Would you like to see a time when there's no more sickness? No dear, I don't think that's possible. Well. That's understandable, because sickness has been around for most of the time that humans have been alive on earth. But there's an interesting promise in the Bible that Isabella would like to share with you. Okay. Isaiah 33 verse 24 says, No resident will say, I am sick. The people dwelling in the land will be pardoned for their error. According to this, what will happen to sickness in the future? Well, according to this, it will be gone. Yeah, won't that be wonderful? That would be nice. I've never heard that before. You know, in many places, one big cause of sickness is that people don't have enough food to eat. But the Bible promises an end to that problem too. Isabella and I would love to come back next week and show you that promise. Okay, I'd like that. Alrighty, so. <clears throat> what was a little bit different about this one? Uh, how about Trifina? This time it was a young little girl preaching. Excellent, right? And um, uh, let's get Brother Thompson also. <coughs> we can say as a parent, the mother prepared her very well. Uh, she's was flawless in her delivery, and it turned out well. Okay, good, I like that. And Sister Huey. So the younger one gave the presentation, and then the older one chimed in. So they really prepared well. Yeah, that was a, that was a nice job. And uh, how did the younger one stay involved? Uh, Sister uh, Simon. Well, she read the she read the scripture and then she asked her the question. Yeah, she she asked her the question right after she read the scripture. So <coughs> we have some young ones, um, and it's not just up to the parents, right? We're 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 all a family, right? So. Let's uh, let's keep that in mind as we have our young ones out and see if we can help them through that process. Um, and uh, then we'll be paying attention to that link question, right? How will the problem of world hunger be solved? There's probably not a person that we talk to if we actually get to that point that won't say, okay, I, I'd like to know that, right? So the, these... Um, these presentations are well thought out. The, uh, the, the teaching committee, uh, the governing body, they, they put a lot of time and effort into these short one minute, one and a half minute conversations that we can have, but um, they pack a punch. So uh, really good, I enjoyed that uh, quite a bit. Okay, now let's um, let's listen to the initial call, uh, Sister Becker. You have our attention. Well, I'm sorry to hear about all the sickness in your family, uh, Mrs. Marin, but I, I hope everybody's on the mend now. Thank you for asking. Yes, I think we're on the mend now. Good, good. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought about what it would be like on Earth if there was no sickness at all? 
Um, I haven't really thought about it. I don't think it's possible. Well, I, I don't blame you for believing that. That's the way most people feel. And of course, sickness has been on the earth as long as there have been humans. Mm -hmm. So to us, it's, it's sort of a natural part of life. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to uh, uh, share with you a very brief scripture in the Bible, in the book of Isaiah, as inspired by God, and it talks about sickness and what the future of sickness will be. And it's, I'd like to read that to you. As I said, it's very short. It's in that chapter, in, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 33, and verse 24. And you notice it says, and no resident will say, I am sick. Hmm. So according to this, What's going to happen to sickness? Well, apparently, according to that, there, there will not be any more. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Mm. It sure would be. We wouldn't have, have to be sitting here talking about the illness of your family or my family. Yeah, that's true. So in uh, many places of the earth, one reason for sickness is because of the conditions they live under, uh, whether it's this country or another country. Um, but because of the food they eat and other conditions. That's true. But I've never heard that before. And that's really, uh, that's really interesting. It's really intriguing, isn't mm -hmm. it? Well, the Bible has much more to say on that subject, and also the causes of, of sickness, including uh, the, the uh, problem of food shortages and so forth many people face. That's true. And I would like to stop by next week, if I may, and sh share more scriptures with you uh, on those subjects. That sounds very interesting. Good. Thank All you right. so much for dropping by. Good. I'll see you then. And I'd like to hear more about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much, sisters. Um, Sister uh, Becker was uh, working on uh, study number three, which is use of questions. and. Uh, by the way, you did a, a very nice job of using questions, Sister Becker. Um, in the how to do it, it, it makes a, a statement that we want to arouse and maintain interest. And we do that by asking questions, which you actually did before you got to the scripture. You, you put something in front of her so that she would be thinking about the answer that you were getting ready to read to her, and I like that. And it, under reason on the subject, if you see that paragraph, reason on the subject, uh, help your listeners to follow the logic of an argument by posing a series of questions that lead to a reasonable conclusion. Uh, another way to say that is that we want to develop the art of using leading questions. See, we can lead the conversation the way we want it to go just by asking the right question, getting them thinking in that mode. And, and you did a really nice job on that. That's something that we all want to practice. Uh, when we have a presentation, we have to think, now what can I say that will lead them to the correct answer? We know the Bible's going to give the correct answer, but we want them to be thinking about it so that when they read the scripture, they get the point. When you ask your question, it drills that point home. Uh, art of leading questions, very, very important part. Thank you very much. That was well done. Now we'll uh, give our attention to uh, Sisters Marin and Wright, the initial call, but this time pay attention to how she overcomes a common objection. You know, sickness is one thing that affects all of us to one extent or another. Do you think that we'll ever see a time when no one will get sick? You know, I really don't have time right now to talk. Are you trying to sell insurance or something? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not selling anything. And I understand your limited time. You know, with our busy lives, time is precious, so I won't take much of yours. However, I would like to take just one minute to share this brief yet thought-provoking thought that's found in the Bible book of Isaiah, Isaiah 33 and verse 24. And notice here it says, And no resident will say, I am sick. The people dwelling in the land will be pardoned for their error. 
Have you noticed according to this what would happen? If people don't say they're not sick. That's kind of amazing. It is, isn't it? It's definitely hard for us to imagine. But one cause of sickness today is due to many lacking sufficient nutritious food to eat. Next time I see you, I'd like to answer the question from the Bible, how will the problem of world hunger be solved? Sounds good. Go for it. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Does everybody say they're busy, usually? Right. I, I like the way you overcame that. Um, don't take this the wrong way, but you have a sweet disposition. <laughs> and that disposition comes across when you talk to people. They, they get it. You know, she said no, 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 but it was a no, 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 right? It, it, was, it was sweet. And that is what appeals to people. We can... We can correct people, but if we do it the right way, they don't take offense to it. I thought you did a very nice job of, uh, of doing that. And, of course, the way we do that is we think about what they're going to say. That's a common objection. We get it all the time. We should be able to go through the process of listening to what they say, which is what she did, and then she even repeated it. To the, to the householder, I can appreciate we're all so busy, we don't have time, right? And she went, she, she got on the same side as her. I just want to take one minute, all right? So th th very well done. Thank you so much. Uh, nicely done. Now let's have our uh, third initial call. Um, uh, and uh, this is probably Brother uh, Roger's favorite thing. Let's see how we can leave the JW.org business card. Brother Adoy. Hey, how are you doing today? Good, I'm doing good. Good, my name is Jason. What's your name? Daniel. Daniel, nice, nice to meet you, Daniel. Pleasure. You know, we're in the neighborhood today. We're talking to our neighbors. We're asking this question. You know, so many people today in the world get sick or are affected by sickness, whether it's a common cold or the flu or whether it's more serious sicknesses. Do you ever think that there will be a time where no one will say that they're sick? Uh, I don't think so. That, that would be nice, but it doesn't sound possible. Yeah, you know, a lot of people feel the same way you do, and they resort to modern medicine for those answers. But the Bible gives a promise that I'd like to share with you here, and that's that Isaiah 33, verse 24. Can, and can you read that for me? Yeah. It says, And no resident will say, I am sick. The people dwelling in the land will be pardoned for their error. Right, right. Very interesting scripture. So it shows here that no resident will say, I am sick. And so that is a promise from the Bible that we can look to for the future. But, you know, so many people today are affected by sicknesses, and that's due to a lack of nutritious food and uh, hunger. And so what I'd like to do is come back next week and share with you a thought on when world hunger would be erased from the world. And before I leave, I wanted to leave with you uh, this contact card here. And if you see on the back there, it has that QR code there. If you take your phone and scan it, it takes you directly to the website, to the JW.org website. And there you can find the answers to any questions that you might have. Yeah, yeah, I think I'll do that. Okay, I'll come back next week. Thanks. Thank you, brothers. Um, brother uh, Odoi was working on study number 11. And that's enthusiasm. Now, when you're talking about a subject that is kind of sad, how do you show enthusiasm? You did one thing very, very nicely. You raised your volume and your tone. And that's an important thing. When we talk about things that can have a negative effect on people, if we don't talk down in the dungeons, we can actually talk about a subject that's not so pleasant, maybe, but that there is a, a, an actual answer for it. And you did that. You actually raised the tone of your voice so that it was more on the happy side than on the sad side. Really nicely done. And that's something that we can all think about. You know, we're, we're thinking about the people we're, we're trying to 
come up with information that's going to teach them that's going to benefit them these presentations that were given have already done that you know they've been given to us that they already do those things we just have to concentrate on the way we say things and when we do that makes a big big difference you know I like that last one breathe life into your delivery when we have some zeal if nothing else they know we believe it and people tend to acknowledge belief level don't shake your head so that's something that we want to be you know be certain of not every subject we talk about is happy because the world isn't but the answers the where we're going to point them to is and so we have to use our voices in such a way that it'll happen nicely done thank you so much brother Adoy okay now we're going to go into our living as Christians and if you can and are willing we'll stand we'll sing song number 84 which is reaching out and then we're going to have brother Alvon come up and we're going to be talking young ones be zealous for fine works and even though this is kind of geared toward young people the reality is there's something there for all of us so we'll see how that goes uh, song number 84 reaching out actually all of us are young compared to forever right so let's uh, <clears throat> give close attention as brother Alvon develops this thing 
Young ones, be zealous for fine works. So, in our Bible reading this week, the assignment, one part was Titus. And in that letter, Paul encouraged Titus to be an example of fine works in every way. Now, Titus was a mature man. You might not say he was young, so to speak. So while we're talking about young persons, uh, that's relative. Do you feel young? Then uh, this talk is for you. So uh, we're going to watch a video momentarily. But uh, think about this. Jehovah has uh, shown us great love. He's given us dignity. And so he gives and gives and gives. Now, I can't forget our song from uh, convention. Unfailing love, that's what Jehovah gives. So is it only Jehovah who can give? Let's look at our video. <laughs> Before I started pioneering, I was really nervous that I wouldn't be able to get my time in every month. It was a bit hard when I started pioneering because uh, I didn't have a car. My boss, he didn't give me part-time work. I found it really hard to balance schoolwork and pioneering at the same time. My biggest struggle was fear of man, so that really hindered me because I wasn't very good at talking to people. Having a good routine was a struggle. My brother and I are the only ones in the troop. My family didn't understand why we wanted to go preaching. I didn't think that I'd make a good pioneer. Well, I've had type 1 diabetes since I was 5, so I was always worried about whether or not I could balance that health condition with pioneering. Challenges don't seem that big now, but back at that time they were a really big deal. But the coolest thing was how Jehovah helped me. Prayer to Jehovah helped me overcome my fears. My family were a massive help from Jehovah because my dad was the one who first encouraged me to pioneer. When I did start pioneering, he promised that I would have the full support of my family. When I spoke to um, brothers and sisters who spent their youth in the full-time service, that really helped me because it was really encouraging um, and it really motivated me to want to make my own memories and my own experiences in the full-time service. So there were practical things I could do. When I didn't have a car, I just walked or I caught the bus. I had to work out what my priorities were first, so I had to find out how many hours did I have to go witnessing every week. So then I just sat down and I looked at every day and planned out which days I could go witnessing, which days I had to go to school and also allocate time so that I could do my homework and study. Having a schedule was really good because I could see it all out in front of me and I could see that the hour requirement was actually attainable so that made it a lot less daunting. I first set short-term goals of pioneering in a special month of activity, then I was able to begin continuous auxiliary, and then eventually I started regular pioneering. One of the best things I did to prepare myself for pioneering was to auxiliary pioneer beforehand. It really set me up to be able to overcome any challenges that I faced while I was pioneering. I thought about Malachi 3.10. I knew I trusted in Jehovah, but this was my chance to test him out. I prayed, put my trust in Jehovah, and put my application in. After my form was in for pioneering, a brother, sorry, a brother called me and offered me work. I had unemployment for three months, which wasn't a good time. But during that time, I had Jehovah as my main focus, and so he supported me and he didn't let me down. Asking brothers and sisters to come and work with me, maybe on days that I knew that I wouldn't get as much support, really helped. Um, that helped me to organise my hours a little bit more and also I'd get to know my brothers and sisters more as well. One of the greatest joys of pioneering has been to pioneer with mum. And we had the privilege of going to the pioneer school together, which was really special. Psalm 16 verse 8 reminds me that Jehovah is right beside me. When I'm preaching, it's like Jehovah is holding my hand. So with full-time service, I love making Jehovah happy. With everything that he's given me, I'm finally able to give something back. Uh, looking back, pioneering was the best decision I've ever made. It's opened up so many different avenues of service to Jehovah, and it helped me also to have that real desire to want to stay in full-time service. 
helping someone on the road to everlasting life. It's the best feeling ever, and it's, it's really irreplaceable. The only thing I can say, as a young person, start pioneering. So, the uh, fine works, one of the fine works that the video was talking about has to do with our preaching and teaching work, and particularly the uh, full-time service. So, uh, let me ask you, what are some steps to the full-time service was mentioned? Did, did the, uh, they just jump right into the full-time service? Uh, Brother Thompson? First, they made a schedule, and then they started to auxiliary pioneer before they jumped right in. Okay, very good. And I saw Anaya. Thank you. Auxiliary during the special months. Yes, very good. So, auxiliary during the special months, and then auxiliary, and then uh, Brother Compton, I saw your hand. Well, the young ones had a mind, not getting their heart to pioneer, but they didn't jump in it. Uh, they talked to her once, like uh, the young sister, she talked to her father, she got encouragement. The other one, uh, sister, she talked to others. And so uh, to, to get the feel of it, to get uh, more confidence along with going to prayer with Jehovah. That's right, very good. So it wasn't a leap or just jumping in, but actually, you know, it was a measured and uh, considered choice in life, and it's a choice Jehovah will bless you for. So uh, they had it in their heart, as Brother Compton mentioned, that they wanted to do more, but uh, what challenges had some overcome to serve as pioneers, and how did they do so? Mm -hmm. Sister Rogers? This one brother said he, he wanted to pioneer, but he didn't have a car, so how was he get around? So he decided, okay, he's just gonna take the bus. Ah, very good. Sister O'Doy? And one of them even had a health issue. She said she had had um, type 1 diabetes since she was 5 years old. So that was a health concern. So as a young person, how would she be able to pioneer balancing the health condition? So she mentioned how she relied on Jehovah and prayed to Jehovah for help and uh, recognized that if she did organize her life well, and jumped in, Jehovah will bless her. She seemed to be happy and enjoying pioneering still. Yes, very good, thank you. Are there any other fears? Uh, Charlie, I see your hand. You need part-time work. Uh, very good. I like to eat, uh, at least once a day. Jadon, and excuse me, Brother Smith. The others had one of the one of the others had fear of man. Yes, sister San Luis. And along with Charlie's comment, the one sister she wanted to go down the part time work, but her boss wouldn't allow her. So uh, eventually, she said she had unemployment. So that meant that she might have quit her job since she had that unemployment for three months. And during that time, she really um, relied on Jehovah, and she said it helped her draw closer to him. And just curious, uh, what was she doing those three months? <laughs> Anaya? She was studying. Okay. Anything else <laughs> was she doing with all of her Bible knowledge? Was she just sitting around waiting for a... Uh... I'll give you a second chance. Go ahead, Anaya. <laughs> Going out in service? Yes, she was going out in service. She had already started to auxiliary pioneer. She was showing that she trusted Jehovah. And for three months, one aspect of her life was uh, unresolved, but Jehovah resolved it for her, right? Uh, and so they had fears, but they were not insurmountable fears. Do you have fears, concerns? Are they insurmountable to Jehovah? 
How can uh, parents help their children become regular pioneers? Do parents have an influence? Brother San Luis? Well, from the two examples that I gathered, <coughs> one was uh, uh, the father who uh, basically verbally and I guess emotionally supported the decision of uh, the young one, their daughter, to pioneer. And the other one was uh, by example, where she was able to pioneer with her mother. So definitely uh, by you know word and deed, we can definitely encourage our children to pioneer. Very good. And the father and the daughter, the daughter, it, we didn't mention it yet, but she had a particular concern. Do you remember what it was that she said? She said that she didn't think she could be a good pioneer. So she had self-doubt. Do we have doubts sometimes? What happens when we have doubts? Where can we go? We have our parents you can go to, your friends, and uh, anybody else you can go to? <coughs> Brother uh, Tilon? Pray to Jehovah. Yes, pray to Jehovah. Uh, let's continue with our next question. Why is having a schedule for preaching important? Sister D'Amato? Well, we can appreciate that, for example, if a house doesn't have a structure, a house isn't going to stand. So it would be the same thing with uh, trying to pioneer. If we don't have any structure in our uh, schedule, it kind of can go by the wayside very easily and fall apart. Very good. Having a structure. I like that phrase. Sister Altier. And you can see that your goal is achievable if you plan it out and, and look to see where you can fit those hours in reasonably. Yes, very good. Uh, Sister uh, Chamberlain? And if you don't plan accordingly, it can throw your whole routine off. So you need to do it as a routine, just like you get up, you go to work, or you have chores. And so you need to, uh, we want to put that first anyway, so that would be the best routine that you can um, organize and plan. Yeah, very good. Structure, routine, have a plan. We should imitate Jehovah. He's a God of order, not disorder, right? So are you able to order your time so that you could pioneer? Think about it. What about the members of the congregation? How can members of the congregation encourage and help a pioneer? There's something very practical. Sister Brown? If the pioneers um, are having a hard time finding people to go, with her, then she can go you know, to different ones in the congregation and ask them to um, work with her. Yes. Is that a chore? Oh, let's get Sister Odoi first. And it's also nice when members in the congregation approach the pioneers to ask when their schedules are and offer to work with them as well. Because sometimes a pioneer might think, well, I don't necessarily want to bother people. So they may come out on the days that they do and work with just those that are there. But if we also reach out as a congregation to them, that's also nice and helpful. Ah, very good. Nice, helpful, reach out. Brother Odoy? And then as we saw in the case of the young, one of the young brothers, um, he needed a job, and, but after he became a regular pioneer, one of the brothers was able to offer him employment. So uh, that's a practical thing to do. Pioneers uh, need to have some kind of uh, uh, financial assistance, and so whatever we can do to assist them financially, maybe help them find a, a good job somewhere, that, that would be very helpful to them so that they'll be able to take care of their own financial needs and continue the pioneer ministry. Very good. And let's qualify that, a good job. Tonight, uh, let's make sure we all do this, right? Turn our phone volume down. We need to do that. Uh, we have two books tonight, uh, Titus and Philemon. So we're going to see two videos on that in our Treasures from God's Word. And... Um, We'll be concentrating on the uh, making appointments of elders and, and how that process uh, happens. 
And then in our Digging for Spiritual Gems, that question, why did Paul not ask Philemon to grant freedom to Onesimus? We'll get that answer. Our Bible reading will be uh, Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. And then we have um, our initial call video, so we'll see that video. That's the third one of the night, by the way. <laughs> 